Good evening, everyone. My name is James Cape, and I am the current president of the Intel Alumni Network. I want to welcome everyone to tonight's fireside chat on the evolution of information technology and its impact on science, industry, and society. Intel and the Intel Alumni Network are truly honored to have two distinguished guests joining us tonight. Renowned author and Hoover Institute fellow Neil Ferguson, and Intel Executive Vice President and General Manager Stu Pan. Unfortunately, Pat was called away on urgent company business. Tonight's discussion will focus on the evolution of information technology, from early innovations like the printing press to the digital revolution of the last 50 years, and looking forward to the disruptive impact of generative AI and beyond. We'll explore the implication of Intel's latest transformative technologies, from Gen AI and cloud computing to the Internet of Things and other convergent technologies. During this fireside chat, the panel will discuss what it will take to realize these technological breakthroughs as the reshoring of manufacturing to the U.S. accelerates, creating resilient supply chains and improving national security. Some of the key topics we'll dive into include the growing role of semiconductors, balancing global competition and collaboration, the urgent need for revamped edu educational system, potential new public-private partnership models, and so much more. Few individuals are better positioned to provide these insights around these topics than our esteemed panelist Neil Ferguson's mastery of historical perspectives, combined with Stu's firsthand experiences directing Intel's cutting-edge innovations, prom which promise to make this a truly thought-provoking and enlightening evening. evening. So without fur further ado, let me welcome Neil and Stu. Neil, you have the floor. Thanks very much indeed, James. I'm gonna show a few slides and, and tell a story, which is really what historians are supposed to do, to set up the conversation that I'm gonna have uh, with Stu. And uh, I'm gonna begin by taking you a long uh, way back in time, uh, all the way back uh, to the time of the 13th and 14th century. Uh, any of you watching me on your travels have been to the beautiful Italian city of Siena. Uh, if you go there, you'll see a fantastic contrast between the square that you see here, the Piazza del Campo, and the Torre uh, del Mangia of the Palazzo Pubblico, which is an extraordinarily tall, thin tower. And this image sums up for me a central idea about the historical process, namely, that it's like, like an interplay between the square and the tower, between networks, those flat, uh, informal structures between individual human beings, and hierarchies, which are like the tower, structured and top-down. And I want to suggest that that's really what a lot of history is about, that interplay. Now, technological change, changes in the nature of hardware, if you like, can determine which of these two get the upper hand. It's a very striking analogy, which I'm going to uh, use here, that you can draw between the impact of the printing press and the impact of the personal computer. These two charts compare prices and quantities of, on the left-hand side, uh, books, and on the right-hand side, personal computers. On the left-hand side, we're going to the 1490s, the time of the Gutenberg printing press through to the 1630s, and on the right-hand side, it's a much more short uh, time frame, 1977 uh, to 2004. And what I think we can see here is the extraordinary impact that a new technology can have in driving down the price of, respectively, a book and a personal computer and then causing an enormous and exponential growth in the, in the volume of these things. And this is uh, a really, really interesting analogy. I'm not the first person to uh, draw it. Indeed, these charts are from uh, another scholar's work, a chap named Dittmar, but I think it's a hugely powerful comparison because both these technologies tended to empower networks and undermine the power of hierarchies. That's why we can see, in the case of the printing press, why the Reformation happened, why the power of the Roman Catholic Church was undermined by the printing press. And then when you look at the uh, extraordinary explosion of the personal computer, you can see the way in which, in the late 20th century, uh, there was an absolute transformation 
in the nature of, of communication. Uh, and the world became more decentralized because of the fact that individuals could access so much more information and compute uh, on their desktops or even on their laptops. So you could think of, of history as a succession of leaps in which communications and other technologies either empower the networks or empower the hierarchies. And that's the interesting thing. There's a kind of pendulum swing. The locomotive, the steam train, you can see Stevenson's rocket next to Gutenberg's printing press here, uh, in fact had a very different impact uh, on the world, as did the jet plane. Uh, but when you get to the, the semiconductor, which of course is absolutely fundamental to the development of personal computing, uh, it's a more decentralizing uh, technology, I'd argue. If you look back just a few years uh, to the late uh, 2010s, we had built, by connecting personal computers and uh, mobile handheld devices, an absolutely unprecedented number of people around the world onto new networks, which were the biggest and fastest uh, in history. And this is just one illustration, a kind of map of the world according to Facebook uh, back in its glory days around uh, 2017. But what's fascinating is that we were also connected physically uh, uh, as much in many ways as we were connected virtually. Uh, this map just shows a simple uh, a depiction of the direct flights that you could take from the city of Wuhan from December 2019 uh, through until the end of January uh, 2020. Uh, and that is, of course, the way in which uh, a certain virus, SARS-CoV-2, because of uh, COVID-19, was uh, spread extraordinarily rapidly around the world. In fact, we've lived through what might be called the shadow side of a networked world in the last uh, four years. Uh, the networks of, of transportation caused the virus to spread with astonishing speed from Wuhan uh, here, for example, to California. It came directly here from, through the direct flights to San Francisco. Uh, but of course, at the same time, the, the networks between our computers and our cell phones allowed other things to spread with tremendous speed, not least misinformation and disinformation about the virus. So what has happened? What is it that's going on here? The answer has to do with the inherent properties of, of networks themselves. And as an historian, I think I'm unusual in being interested in that and wanting to understand network science as a way of understanding the historical process. I wrote a book about this called The Square and the Tower, not perhaps entirely surprisingly, which made six arguments, or I suppose just conveyed six truths about network structures. Number one, the principle of homophily, birds of a feather flock together. Number two, it's a small world thanks to weak ties. Number three, network structure as much as the content of anything determines virality. Number four, networks never sleep. They're constantly shape-shifting, they're not static. Number five, it takes a network to defeat a network. I learned that from Stan McChrystal talking about how he defeated the Al-Qaeda terrorist network in Iraq. And finally, a network world isn't a flat world. In fact, it turns out to be a highly unequal uh, world because of things like superstar economics. As I mentioned, steam technology, railroads and steamships, created a very hierarchical world in practice. The British Empire was the ultimate hub and spoke network. London was the center, not only for railroads around the United Kingdom and across to the continent, but it was the center of all the great steamship lines and of the telegraph lines. The Victorian internet had this central hub in London. And mid-century American capitalism, pre-Intel, in the days when firms like General Motors were dominant, was also very hierarchical. And the mid-20th century world that we've now left behind was a, a world of org charts that looked like this. I'd suggest that the second networked age, if we think of the first one as having been caused by the printing press, and the second one as having been caused by the, the personal computer, actually emerged from a crisis of the hierarchical state from the late 60s through to the 1970s. Let me try to simplify the story this way. Why did Silicon Valley happen? I think the answer is because in Washington, they were so preoccupied 
with Vietnam and Watergate that they didn't really notice what was going on here. And that allowed people like Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce and Andy Grove to bring about an extraordinary technological revolution that would probably not have happened if the Pentagon, if the Department of Defense had been as closely focused as it might have been but for the distractions of Vietnam and Watergate. So that's one of the arguments I try to make in the book, that we should understand this kind of decentralized age, the second network age is coming out of a crisis of the hierarchical system uh, of central government. So you could think of the internet as a consequence rather than a cause of weakening central control. And here I've just tried to illustrate some of the seminal moments in the rise of the internet, the ARPANET, uh, DNS, the World Wide Web, and of course, the two iconic figures, uh, Jobs and, and Gates. This is why what's happening at this company is of such enormous national and historical importance. That's what Stu and I are just about to discuss. Because when you think about some of the unintended consequences of the decentralization of the world, which we've also sometimes called globalization, it probably wasn't the best idea ever to locate all of semiconductor production, or at least the most sophisticated semiconductor production, on an island that happens to be claimed by the People's Republic of China. For Intel to revive is clearly of enormous importance for the United States, because Intel's really the only plausible contender to challenge TSMC for its dominance in the market for the most sophisticated semiconductors. That's partly why I accepted the invitation to come here and have this conversation. It's why I'm looking forward very much to hearing what Stu has to say. With that, I'll turn to him. Well, thank you for that introduction. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, I, well, I'm not the student of history that you are. Uh, I did grow up in Detroit, which was the center of American manufacturing back when GM, when Sloan was talking about those higher growth charts. And to me, you know, manufacturing is really what made this country great. Absolutely. And, you know, I think of what the challenge for us is right now as Intel, is we want to maintain this manufacturing lead here in this country. You know, Gene Raimondo, Secretary Raimondo has called us Intel, quote, Intel is this country's national chip champion. And we're really excited about working with the CHIPS office to make this a reality because, candidly, we, you know, as, as many of the people in the alumni network know, we had some self-inflicted wounds over the last several years. We are digging ourselves out of that hole, but I think we all feel this sense of mission from pat on down to make sure the U.S. keeps this center of gravity in American manufacturing. When you look at what we do up in Portland, for example, which is the heart and soul of Moore's Law, you know, we're working with things at the atomic level, things that you just can't do unless you have, you know, the right infrastructure, the right people, the right equipment, the right mindset. And so we're incredibly focused on making this a reality. And I think we all feel that uh, it's more than just a job. It really is a mission to keep this centered with the country because it, if what happens if we don't do this? Right. Where does this go? Does the world really want to see, uh, you know, just one area for this, what is really, I think, as some people call the oil, you know, of this century. And, you know, I think we are on our way. We still have more work to do, but I think, we're, you know, we're making some good starts. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that. I mean, if you think about the automobile, it was a technology that mm -hmm. the United States pioneered. And right. the idea of mass mobility in, in automobiles was really an American vision. It was an elite product right. in, in Europe. but. This was where Henry Ford made it a mass product. Now, over time, the US inevitably uh, encountered competition, Japan, Germany, yeah. successful automobile exporting economies. But the national security implications of our losing market share, of our becoming, to some extent, an importer of automobiles was really quite minimal. I mean, ultimately, right. you can manufacture right. a car pretty much everywhere. Uh, and in fact, there's automobile manufacturer just about in most uh, developed economies now. Mm -hmm. So it's in fact not particularly strategically uh, vulnerable as a sector. Mm -hmm. Semiconductors are different. Oh, yeah. and, and the fact that the most sophisticated ones are indispensable for artificial intelligence only raises the stakes. I mean, the stakes were already high uh, before, but I think we've now entered new terrain really since the world woke up to the importance of AI. Well, I think you know, one of the things that we, our vision, for example, with the, the factory that we're putting up in Ohio, which is, you know, the you know twenty seven billion dollar investment for us, uh, it the current land that we have plowed out right now is seven times the size of Disneyland. It will be at some point we hope 
the largest semiconductor manufacturing facility in the United States, potentially in the world. And it, in some ways, we wanted to be the manufacturing center for artificial intelligence. We have the kind of technologies that can build the most cutting edge, you know, AI devices with you know, our advanced lithography like Intel 18A and now Intel 14A. And imagine the resurgence of manufacturing and the irony of, you know, it was once the Rust Belt, you know, Pat is now called the Silicon Heartland. Right. And AI will be, the, I think, the tailwind that really accelerates the need for these devices because uh, we just, uh, earlier today, we had uh, one of the uh, senior fellows from Microsoft in talking to the, the leadership team. And he talked about the insatiable demand that AI pre presents. And he said, even with all the advances that anybody could possibly see, he felt we were still 100 times short yeah. of the capacity that he feels we're going to need in order to pull off AI. So I think we are very well positioned uh, to take advantage of this. And you know, when I first came back to Intel a few years ago, because I took, a, as Pat said, I took a brief vacation to run supply chain at HP. Uh, you know, I came back and we asked Pat, well, why are we building all these factories? He said, because, I, you know, Pat, I believe we'll need it. Semiconductor industry is going to be a trillion dollar industry. Back three years ago when he made this decision. But none of us anticipated AI. Nobody. You know, it wasn't even, you couldn't spell AI in somebody's forecast at the beginning of last year. And now, now it's the rage. But it, it's, you know, when you talk about the Internet and the PC, the, in the 43 years I've been in technology, this is the most disruptive technology I've seen. It's more disruptive than the creation of the PC itself. Yep. And you know, I, I like to say that you know, I the IBM PC and I have the one thing we have in common is we both started with Intel 1981. Uh, but you take a look at what the PC has done, what uh, laptop computing has done, the internet has done. This is of that same kind of yep. magnitude. Can I ask a question? I mean, out of curiosity, really, why do you think Intel? You said it yourself a minute ago that Intel, in a way, lost its way or made, it made mistakes that explain its period of uh, well, it's the share price kind yeah. of shows it the period in the doldrums. Help, help, and an outsider yeah. understand what that was because what's fascinating to me as somebody who taught at two business schools in his career is is understanding these cycles where businesses yeah. rise, they appear dominant, then they enter a period of, of the doldrums. But they can come out of that. Talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, you know, I think uh, this is not a surprise to the people who are listening right now. We, you know, we went through a number of CEOs with a number of different visions. Uh, the CEO that we had from 2014 through 2019 had a different vision for the company. He wanted to explore opportunities in watches and drones and clothes and many other things that, uh, you know, were pre maybe took us a little far afield, and we didn't focus on the thing that made this company great, which is manufacturing technology. The idea that Moore's law, you know, is a law, you know, a time-driven law that drove us every two years to double the number of transistors on the device. And when we lost that, and we lost our process advantage, that was the underpinning of the entire company strategy. We lose process, and we can't make as good of products, which means we compromise on the products and try and do things to compensate for that. And what Pat has done with this idea that he calls five notes in four years, the ability to get back on track to process leadership in 2025, that's really the underpinning of the coming back of the company. And the only way we'll be able to compete successfully with TSMC is if we have process equivalence and process leadership. Because while everybody is rooting for us to bring manufacturing back to the United States, Nobody will do an inferior product with our process technology. We must give our customers, you know, a process technology. There, there, there's a four-letter acronym that the, you know, the semiconductor uses to measure this. Power, performance, area, and cost. There's no marketing in the foundry business that I run in. You can't market your way out of this. Those are four metrics. You either are better than your competition or you're not, and your customers will decide to use you or not based on this, and if, you know, if we have a resilient supply chain, that's great, and if we have a secure supply chain, that's great, but if they can't do great products with us, they're gonna be reluctant to embrace us, and what Pat has brought back to the company is the focus on that. Yeah. Great process technology, great products, and we, you know, we're operationally driving the company driven now, differently now because we have a foundry business that operates at arm's length with the product business. Why do we do that? Because it makes both businesses right. better. Right. And we are violently focused on what we need to do to meet and beat TSMC you know, on the battlefield. I was re reading Chris Miller's Chip yeah. War. Chris was my student, and I, 
I'm very proud of what, of what he's achieved. There's a moment in there when Morris Chang is mm -hmm. explaining the foundry principle. And even Gordon Moore says, you've had great ideas, Morris, but this isn't one of them. So I guess <laughs> Morris Chang kind of won that argument belatedly. And, and now you're going to yeah. adopt something more like that. Model, yeah, but not exactly. Not exactly. I mean, I think the, uh, and I, I talked about this in the keynote that uh, uh, Pat and I did a few weeks ago at Foundry Day. I think what TSMC did brilliantly is they focused on cost and they fast followed our technology until we slipped and they were able to right. surpass us. And because of that, they created a whole new layer of, you know, capability underneath us that enabled our competitors on the product side to do better products. Um, what we're changing now with, with our strategy is we have 40 years of history of being a systems company. We help pioneer the PC. We help accelerate the server market. We help create networking. What we're doing now is taking all of that knowledge that we've had over the last 40 years and putting it as a foundry offering. So in other words, we know how to do very complex server parts, which are a lot like the AI parts that you see today. Let's take that capability and offer it to our foundry customers. If they want advanced networking, we can help them with that. If they want to do, put multiple devices on a single package, we know how to do that. And in many ways, we are a system company turning into a foundry and not the other way around. Right. And I actually, I had a chance in, in the talk I gave, I used a presentation that Morris gave, where he said, here's my business model. And then I drew our business model around that right. because, and I think people picked up, including Chris, by the way, that this is different because you know to go at somebody head on at what they're really good at, not great strategy. Right. You know what we're trying to do is take what we're really good at, combine these all these different elements, and do something different. And in this era of AI, which requires, you know, s superb capabilities and technology, we're a great on ramp for a lot of these customers because we'll, we will, if you will, componentize the company, and sell it to people who want to mix and match stuff. And that's something TSMC can't do because they don't have the history that we have of 40 years of doing this. So as an historian, I'm always struck by the fact that context sometimes can do more right. than even the most brilliant CEO. You need the context to kind mm -hmm. of be in your favor. And it seems to me that it is in a couple of ways. One is the geopolitics. I mean, part sure. of what happened to the semiconductor industry was that we assumed for more than a decade that there would never really be a Cold War situation, and therefore you could globalize production uh, yep. and simply go to what was the, the cheapest market for whatever it was. And that globalization era in the 1990s, especially after 2001, when China joins the World Trade Organization, I think was part of the context that made life inherently difficult for a company like like Intel, that there was a belief that was quite widespread in Washington that you actually didn't need to manufacture anything in North America anymore. So that context has clearly changed. But AI is the other thing that's changed the context. Mm -hmm. The demand for very sophisticated semiconductors is now so massive, as you just mentioned, that it's not plausible that just one company can serve that need. So in a way, the context yeah. changed in Intel's favor in mm -hmm. two ways. We, we now realize that we have to manufacture strategically vital products in the United States. We can't expect it all to be done in, in East Asia. But there's also this sense that the demand for semiconductors yeah. at the cutting edge is just so vast that it absolutely has to be a North American player that can, that can match TSMC and then, as you say, evolve the model in a new direction. Well, I think, I, you know, clearly the U.S. government recognizes this was the impetus for the CHIPS Act. And this was, by the way, CHIPS Act started before this AI thing happened. CHIPS and Science Act. CHIPS and Science Act, thank you. I always like to Oh, yeah. And was this just, was a bipartisan. And it, and it was. I mean, it, was, it, it, it wasn't it, just the government. It was well, both parties. It both part, and it, by a significant way, it was one of the, you know, in terms of the number of votes between Republicans, Democrats, and Congress, this is one of the highest number of total votes ever done on any piece of legislation for you know, the last two Congresses. I think, you know, People realize that this, this need originally came about because of the, what happened with COVID and the shortage of semiconductors because, you know, what, the industry didn't invest. And, of course, you know, when, when COVID hit, consumer good purchases went up a couple percent, and that's enough to drive shortages everywhere. So out of that was born this idea of a CHIPS Act. But now phase two is, you know, some of these supply constraints ease. There's this new thing on the horizon that's actually far more demanding than the devices that we were short in back you know, a few years ago, because those were the 40 nanometer, 55 nanometer, older technologies that you used to build cars and washing machines and everything else. This is very different. Right. And this is something that only, you know, really 
three companies in the world can do, and only two of them do them really well, us and TSMC. And Samsung is spending money here and doing investment, but you know they're primarily a DRAM company, and their best people go to DRAM production. So it's you know us and them, and I think you know there, there's, you know being a student of history, there's a little quote from Larry, Louis Pasteur: "A chance, per, you know, per, you know, favors a prepared mind," and I think Pat prepared the company for this moment, not knowing that fully what it would be. Right. But, yeah, but here we are. Context is so it, powerful. And I think it's, uh, we're just really in the early innings of this. I don't think we really know just how pervasive this is going to be. You know, the stock market believes it knows, perhaps, but I don't think we, we really know just yet. I'm, I'm uh, somebody who, who reads in the popular science area, and I, I read Mustafa Suleiman's book, The yeah. Coming Wave. And I've known Mustafa since yeah. before the the kind of craze, which I guess ChatGPT kicked off. So, I mean, I've talked to him and I've talked to Demis Hassabis for yeah. years about the implications of AI. And I, I think they're actually bigger than people realize. I mean, there's a mistake, I think a mistake that's commonly made, and it's made by journalists, is to focus on large language models mm -hmm. that are good at impersonating humans. I mean, that, to me, yeah. that's trivial compared with, for example, what they were able to do with uh, protein folding. Yeah. I, in medical science, we, we have a, a, we're on the edge of a, of a new era. But I keep coming back to the sheer scale of this. I mean, if Sam Altman uh -huh. thinks he needs $7 trillion, I don't know where $7 trillion is going to come from, uh, certainly not the U.S. Yeah. government. No. But, I mean, the, the question I also come up, and I'd love to get your thoughts yeah. on this too, is how do we actually power all this? I mean, this is going to need yeah. a lot of electricity. You guys are in the server, or you've been yeah. in the server's business yeah. since it was invented. How do you think about the sheer electricity demand that there's going to be? You know, actually spending time studying this right now because we're putting up all these factories to build these AI devices. They ultimately have to go into a data center right. that has to have power. Yeah. And so a lot of our customers that, that we're in discussions with talk about this. And the biggest single thing that we can do to help them is to give them the most power efficient components right. they can possibly use for the kind of computing they want to do. So if you have power efficient processors, if you have different ways of architecting memory, so that as you're moving bits around, we actually measure how many picojoules, you know, it takes to do a calculation. And how can we make that even more efficient on the trillions and trillions of calculations? Because it's a scale game. So if you can shave off, you know, just a tiny amount of energy on every computation, you can pack much more into a server rack. You can pack many more racks into a data center and you can power them more effectively. So we're spending a lot of time figuring out not just how to do the devices, but how to do the whole rack and make sure it's the most powerful thing, you know, most power efficient rack you can possibly put in a data center. Because if you don't look at it as a system, just the same way you described in some of your charts, it's the system implications of doing this that at the rack level that will determine the cost effective nature of AI. And our conversations with our customers now aren't just about chips, they're about systems of chips exactly. and how they come together because every jewel matters. You know, from a greenhouse gas, from emissions point of view, you know, all, you know, the, carbon, you know the different scope carbon emissions, they all get measured on this. So they, their limiter is power. By the way, the other limiter they're gonna have is construction. You know, getting the yeah. trades and this is something, you know, I'm on uh, Secretary Romano's task force for supply chain competitiveness. With, you know, the Infrastructure Act, uh, you know, $500 billion of infrastructure investment. The CHIPS Act, $39 billion, right? Inflation Reduction Act, you know, just, you know, putting more incentives out there. We're about to embark on this massive wave of construction in this country that we better get ready for. Right. And you know that's that's going to be another constraint in all this. In addition to the power, is just getting everything built out. Are we ready for it though? I mean, the Wall Street Journal had a story the other day about the slow pace at which the new TSMC uh, uh, plant is being built in Arizona versus its counterpart in Japan. And I found myself thinking, yeah. gee, uh, are we going to encounter a red tape problem uh, that is going to slow this great infrastructure boom? Well, I mean, are you uh, an you know, I think the TSMC story is a little different in that. Sure. You know, they. They have never built in this country, right? An example, in this country, when you submit drawings to permitting groups, you submit them in English. You don't submit them in metric. Something they learned. Yeah. Uh, I learned that too, but yeah. that's another <laughs> so, story. <laughs> but, you know, I think you have to look at, you know, do you have the capability to manage, you know, literally a village of construction teams, of, you know, suppliers and vendors to get them all coordinated. And that's, that's an acquired skill. 
And I think we know how to do that. I think the more general concern I have is, are, are there gonna be enough data centers built right. out? Are there gonna be enough power plants near the data centers? Are they gonna have enough power supply? Can you get on the grid fast enough? Yeah. Because we wanna make sure we're building enough capacity for all this, but if we're waiting for three years for somebody to hook up a data center to a power grid, that's problematic. And we're, we're now in conversations with uh, the Commerce Department, uh, and I've got uh, some help with some of our team in Washington actually looking at this now. Okay, how do we help this? How do we make sure we're planning for it? How can the administration you know, make sure we have enough construction people and we have enough power transmission equipment? And how do we make sure that all those incentives happen? Because it is a network effect. And if you don't think about all the knock-on right. effects that go on in this, you could wind up being short. So the optimistic view is, and I was thinking this as I was driving through the traffic uh, from the Stanford mm -hmm. campus to the Intel campus. You know, it's still California that where, mm -hmm. where the dreams happen. AI has mm -hmm. been fundamentally kicked forward into a new okay. era by companies based in the US West Coast and mm -hmm. or by companies that were acquired by the companies based here. So the optimistic view is the US has still got it and it's, it's pulled ahead of say China uh, in AI. But your point is that we really need to have a com comprehensive strategy that includes our power grid, that has a coherent plan for all mm. the data centers. I mean, in theory, Absolutely. North America has major advantages to begin with, over Europe, certainly, when it comes to just the cost of ele electricity. Yeah. But I'm wondering if, if we really have the capacity to, to pull off this this massive, it's more than reshoring, because we're right. actually building a, a completely new kind of manufacturing capacity for a new mm -hmm. era yeah. of technology. Now the US did that in the 20th century, did it in the 19th century, and you know, as a historian, I think of yeah. the history of the United States as a series of extraordinary economic miracles. You know, first of all, mm -hmm. from the late 18th century into the 19th, the US is extremely good at copying the British Industrial Revolution and then scaling it. And then in the yeah. course of the 19th century, you take it to the next level and you do, uh, with uh, the likes of Andrew Carnegie, you do the, the, the really innovative uh, manufacturing at massive mm -hmm. scale. Uh, and this just carries on in the 20th century. We already talked about automobiles. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the dominant industrial power of the United States that wins World War II, and then mm -hmm. is dominant and ensures the US triumphs in the Cold War. Do we still have the mojo to make it the same story in the 21st century. That's what I can't quite make up my mind about. You know, I think this administration has that mojo. Uh, the secretary and her team, I think, understand this. Uh, the secretary and her team, uh, you know, we, as we worked on them with the CHIPS Act, we had this AI systems factory concept with them. And they realized, and they're working with a lot of people in the industry, you know, Willie Shea out of MIT is an example, to go figure this out. I think. I'd like us to move faster, but I think the realization, remember once again, AI was just something people started talking about last year, and now it's like this, oh my gosh, moment. We need these things, we need the data centers, we need the power distribution, and you know, that's also in parallel with the electrification in the United States for you know, BEVs, you know, for electric vehicles. So we've gotta get our act together here, but I think there's a, a realization, at least with the Commerce Department, I think we have to work closer with Congress on this to really get, because we, we could really have a, a whole renaissance of manufacturing, construction, infrastructure builds, electrification. We can work with our partners, our trading partners who can help build some of this capability and bring in and create you know, jobs you know, with the ASEAN partnership that you know, some of the trade agreements are putting in place. We have the chance to do it if we take a leadership role in it. And I think we're, the administration is starting to grasp that, but we also have an election year coming up and things get a little bit distracted and you know we'll see if how that all plays out and whether or not whoever winds up in the White House you know come next year has that same kind of mojo but this is a political question I think the country needs to get its arms around like who's going to do this well I'm get really it done? by the bipartisan consensus that we talked about before and in a way the notion that you've got to kind of bring manufacturing back to the United States predates Joe Biden. It was a it does. key talking point of Donald Trump's 2016 campaign. And so I'm struck by the fact that on just this one thing, I mean, it may be the only thing, but on this one thing, there is something like a bipartisan consensus. And whatever people mean by making America great again, it kind of boils down to regaining some kind of manufacturing lead. Uh, and you know, in, that, in that sense, I'm not sure that the election is quite as crucial as it is in maybe other areas. 
I think it depends on how well Congress can cooperate on something. You know, can we, can we, you know, give oversight and provide guidance and provide investment? You know, if, for example, uh, we decide that we want to put tariffs on circuit breakers that are built in China, is that a good thing for the country if we can't build data centers? So I think it will depend on whether or not we have a coherent industrial policy that is supported by both sides of the House uh, that we can unify on and just say, look, for the good of the country, this is our moment to go regain this advantage. And by the way, take a good portion of the world and help them out too, because as we grow, we'll bring other jobs in other countries. So it's a question of taking a leadership role versus arguing about what's right and what's wrong. And I think that'll be the, you know, the challenge of the next administration, because this is not gonna get solved this year next year. I mean, this is a build out that's going to go on for a very, very long time. So the, the great nightmare for Americans is that they're actually in the situation of, of the Brits. Uh, if you go oh. back to the mid 20th century, you've got this yep. uh, extraordinary global leadership role. You've got military and naval commitments everywhere. You've got a very large debt. But the truth is your manufacturing edge has kind of gone and you just can't get it back, because that was Britain's fate. That was and I grew up in a, in a Britain that was deindustrializing. I grew up uh, in, a, in a, the west of Scotland where the yeah. steelworks were closing and yeah. the shipyards were closing and, and nothing took their place. And so, you know, I keep asking myself, are, are, are we sure this isn't the situation that's developing in the United States? So what, what yeah. do you think the differences are? Well, I mean, I, I look back on, on Britain's failure mm. as being partly a, a loss of research and development leadership, mm -hmm. a kind of uh, seeding of, of innovative leadership to other countries. Uh, excessively powerful unions played a part mm -hmm. in Britain's decline. A, a welfare state that was, in fact, unaffordable relative to the country's economic needs. When you look at the situation of the United States today, it's clearly not stagnant in the way that Britain was post-1945. Right. Actually, the economy has been growing more strongly Extra than anybody, than any economist really right. foresaw. So it doesn't feel entirely like the same situation. But there is this big public debt that's accumulated that's now in excess of, what, 100 plus percent of, of GDP. GDP that, right. That's absorbing fiscal resources. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that the administrative state the bureaucratic state is a lot bigger than it was when Intel was founded. And anybody who's tried to do even a, a modest amount of renovation to their home in California will know that there's a, a permitting, permitting system of mm -hmm. mind-blowing complexity. So I wonder if the United States has, in some ways, shackled itself with burdens that will make what you're describing difficult, or are you basically optimistic that those shackles are quite you, weak? You know, I, I wasn't optimistic until I watched what happened in Ohio. So I grew up in Detroit, where Detroit got in right. deindustrialized, yeah. right? Well, I watched the auto- We both come from cities that went through that. Went through that. And uh, you know, I watched, you know, uh, my wife was born in Ohio. You know, watched Ohio deindustrialize, you know, the tire companies, all, you know, everybody, you know, you saw plants closing everywhere. And what happened in Ohio was extraordinary. When we were doing our site selection, and we went to Governor DeWine and the Ohio State Legislature and, and the, of course, the congressional delegation. And they came to us with this integrated plan of government grants, but more importantly, here are the community colleges we're gonna go enable to go help build the skill set for the people who work in this factory. Here are the trades we're gonna bring to the factory network to go help the construction. Here are the universities we're gonna cooperate with. So, I mean, I, went to, I did my grad work in Michigan so I was obviously disappointed that we put the plant in Ohio, but Michigan and Ohio State cooperating on, you know, you know, advanced graduate degrees and semiconductors, along with Purdue, along with Northwestern. So the whole area pulled together, and I think, you know, it's gonna pull off what probably be regarded as one, I think, one of the economic miracles of the Midwest, and potentially for the whole country, because it's only by creating this ecosystem, you know, um, Porter talks a lot about the competitive advantage of nations, right? You know, the, the leather factories in, in Italy, as an example of how we create a community of people who are artisans. We're creating a community of technology artisans outside of Columbus. I mean, who would have thought? And it's that kind of thing that we see happening, not only in Ohio, but also in Arizona, uh, also in Oregon, also in New Mexico, creating these magnets and getting the government to participate in a way, 
I didn't think they would. Yeah, it's do you just give me two reasons to be cheerful because Britain did not have federalism. There couldn't be regions of, of Britain that in the post-45 right. period made the effort uh, because it was really quite a centralized system of government. The other thing you've mentioned, universities. Uh, because the United States has a great many universities right. uh, that excel in mm -hmm. STEM and still lead the world in that area, the US has strengths that looking back on Brit British history, Britain did not have in the post-war era. So that's two reasons to yeah. feel optimistic. Talk a bit about the timeline of the Ohio project. And, uh, well, we Ohio right what now we is, is planned for mid-28. Uh, it will, our current plan is to put our most leading edge technology in that factory. So we develop it in, in Oregon, we'll transfer it to Ohio, and then we'll start ramping from there. But depending on what market demand looks like, we could pull it in, we could change roadmaps. But you know, we're building the buildings to be flexible. We're building the buildings to be upgradable. So you don't have to tear down a building anymore. You, you, know, you, you can, from what we can tell, we can run these buildings for 20 years with all the next generations of technology. We're building the infrastructure around it, you know, all of the uh, waste distribution capabilities, all the electrification, all of the you know, supplier networks are going around it. And I think you know, we'll be up and running pretty strong in 28 time frame, maybe a little earlier, depending if demand pulls itself in. And as we play out this AI systems factory concept, I think there's a good chance we could do something sooner, but it's too early yet to commit to that. Uh, but you know, it was exciting. And, you know, the other element that you know, I wanted to make sure that we, we bring up here is the community college network. It's not just enough to have the university grads. It's the people in the factories who are you know, doing these you know, $100,000 jobs who have to be trained in statistical process control and advanced automation. And it's not something you need you know, a PhD out of Michigan to, to do. You just need a good skill set. And that, it's that network of people who want to do that kind of work, who, who enjoy that kind of work, who are good at it. If we give them the chance to go learn and go work in these factories, yeah, this is employment for decades. So this is an important issue, and that is education. One reason that the United States pulled ahead of the competition mm -hmm. in the 19th century was it had the best education in the world. Mm -hmm. So it pretty quickly had the best educated workforce. And uh, you can see that in all the data that, that, that you get for the 19th and 20th century. It continues right on into the 20th century. I don't think the United States is any longer a world leader when it comes to basic education, at the primary or secondary level. Mm -hmm. You look at the PISA scores, Correct. they're pretty dismal. So, I mean, I, I worry about that because community colleges and universities mm -hmm. are great, but if we're not teaching math at, the, at the early, and the st science at the early stages of education, I think we're handicapping ourselves. Did, do, you have a, do you have a view on that? I'm, I'm quite concerned about where American education has, has landed and, and worry that we're not addressing that question. And if we don't address that question, mm -hmm. then I think it's extremely hard for the United States to have the kind of industrial technological leadership you're talking about. I do have that worry. Uh, in fact, uh, both of my children uh, were part of Teach for America. And they were both uh, TFA grads out of the, you know, their co one was a, a teacher in the Bronx, one was a teacher in, uh, in Dallas, and in some pretty economically challenged environments. And, you know, I, and this is a personal feeling, it's not an Intel policy thing, but, you know, we, we don't reward our teachers enough, we don't give right. them enough infrastructure, uh, we don't give them enough encouragement. And, you know, they, this is the future, you know, of America, is what, where this happens, and I think we do need to invest more in education. You know, and, and in the infrastructure and the training and just make it a desirable thing to do. Uh, you know, you look at some of the TFA grads, uh, and I've talked to a number of my, my kids' friends who, you know, stuck it out and stayed in TFA, but a lot of them just did their two-year commitment right. and decided to leave because they just didn't feel that there was adequate recognition, rewards, and even just the basic necessities to go teach their kids. And I think we ignore this, uh, you know, as a country at, at our peril. Uh, but I think if we create flourishing communities with flourishing appointments and good jobs, we'll hopefully get the tax base and the infrastructure necessary to keep you know, educating these, you know, these kids and bring them along into these, you know, these areas. And by the way, it doesn't have to go, they don't have to go to a four-year college to do this. Right. They, some of them don't want to do that. But give them a chance, a two-year degree and a great job, 
you know, a lot of these kids will take it. We just have to give them the right encouragement and infrastructure. Well, I'm doing what I, I can, although I'm in the higher education business. So we're starting a new university in Austin, which is, is designed to, to counter some of the, I think, unhealthy trends that we see in higher education today and focus on uh, interdisciplinary education, making STEM as foundational as, as the classic books. And I noticed the time I spent in Texas, some of what you were talking about, uh, because things get built fast uh, in Texas, and it's not just uh, Elon Musk who's there. There's been there's been a real revitalization of the Texan economy. So this this is kind of music uh, to my yeah. ears. But I think we need lots and lots more new educational institutions that are trying to rebuild American education and set not lower standards mm -hmm. than they have in East Asia, but higher standards. We, we need to be at the top of those PISA league tables, not in the kind of middle. And I think that's, that's as much a priority in my mind as you know building, building new foundries. We need to build new schools. Well, I mean, I did look at the website because when really James said, hey, you know, he's interested in this University of Austin. So I went on, I think, because my daughter is a UT grad. And so I, thought, so I thought to myself, okay, is this part of UT? Well, it doesn't look like it's part of UT. It looks like something different. And I think the thing that's fascinating about Austin, if you look at the investment there, you know, what, what Elon Musk is doing with the Gigafactory, which is the largest factory in the United States, uh, what Michael Dell, of course, has built with, you know, with Dell and, and you know, the huge influence he has in that area, uh, Apple's there, Google's there. There's probably no better laboratory to go figure all this out than Austin. And I certainly hope that, you know, and I look through the website and then you have an amazing roster of, you know, just all these different people. Right. Fascinating background. Uh, Mamet, you know, was David Mamet yeah. in, in there. And was, David, David Mamet, who, who wrote one of the great monologues of American drama and Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, Ross, the always yeah. be closing monologue. Well, he's, yes. he's going to come and, closing, and, yeah. and, and do some uh, yeah. drama and we'll, we'll have a theater there where we're hoping David will put on new work. So. I think the, the spirit of building new stuff is right. kind of, it's reawakened uh, in America. And I think it should be reawakened in every part of our economy, building new foundries, building new new universities. That's, that's a very American approach. Once upon a time, mm -hmm. all the universities were right. new universities. Uh, and we kind of lost that habit. And I, I got the impression that we were just content with the universities we had, but now I think, uh, people have realized that you have to build new stuff. You have to rejuvenate each sector. And sometimes the only way to do that is to build something new. And one of the key yeah. ideas that I, I have is that people may, may not need a four-year undergraduate degree, or they may want that, that senior mm -hmm. year to be spent in partnership with the private sector, getting in mm -hmm. to you know, working with uh, firms, uh, whether Tesla or others. Uh, my sense is yeah. that a lot of young people are impatient to get that kind of hands-on uh, experience. And after three academic years, they can have a fourth practical year, and why not? And I think we should. I mean, uh, my, my son is currently at, at Michigan doing his, his grad work since his sister went back to grad school and he decided he needed to go back to. Uh, but, you know, he is, uh, right, he spent the week at Microsoft doing a program up there. And I think we in the technology business, we can play a huge catalytic role in enabling that. But it, it takes time, it takes, you know, resources, and in the you know, tyranny of the urgent, especially with as fast as our business is changing, we sometimes don't find the time to go do that. And I do think we probably need to do a better job of setting it. Microsoft does a good job in this, Dell does a good job in this. I think Intel needs to do more. Uh, but as Pat, you know, has been on this five nodes and four year journey, we haven't had much time. As we get back to where, you know, we rightfully belong, which is a leadership role, it will be, you know, that'll be another time for us to go play that, pay it forward and do things with, you know, at one point we were big supporters of the National Science Foundation and, and the science talent search. I'd love to see us get back into that when we, you know, are through the next year, year and a half or so. You just mentioned that. Microsoft and I want to ask a, a question about the, the, the big companies, that are, mm -hmm. the hyperscalers that are really driving the AI revolution. Uh, in, in my presentation, I talked about decentralizing mm -hmm technologies. At one level, we've seen a lot of centralization since the internet came into mm -hmm. existence. I mean, initially it was supposed to be very, very decentralized. That was the Tim Berners-Lee mm -hmm. World Wide Web. Right. Uh, and, and yet with amazing speed, the internet in effect, or the World Wide Web, became dominated by a few network platform companies uh, and a, a handful of companies like Microsoft that dominated software. Mm -hmm. 
is that, do you think, a fixed reality that will continue through this AI revolution, i.e. it will be Microsoft, it will be Google, it'll be Meta and Amazon, and they will be they will be really driving and dominating this process? Or do you envision a structural change in which new entrants or entrants from different parts of the ecosystem become as powerful? I think it, it depends on um, what they're doing. I mean, the reason Amazon, Google, Microsoft is much more a capital concentration, right? You know, Microsoft's uh, CapEx bill this year is $50 billion, right? It's more than Intel's. Right. Uh, you know, Google, Meta, same kind of, you know, same kind of, a little less than, than Microsoft. But, but if you look at what's happened in AI models, right? OpenAI came out of nowhere. Uh, Anthropic, Mistral, people that you didn't hear, didn't even exist, you know, companies that didn't exist two years ago, all of a sudden in, in the news of, hey, they're doing this model development. That's, so I think for software, which doesn't require the capital costs of running a big data center, Software is an area where people will innovate like crazy and companies will spring out of nowhere and, and probably also wither just as quickly as they sprang up if they don't stay competitive. Uh, but, you know, you talked earlier about, the, you know, California, you know, you know, particularly San Francisco, right? Some people were saying San Francisco is now coming back because all the AI folks like to live up there and because people are investing in new software companies and doing innovative work there. So I think it'll be a mixture, right? If it's not a capital concentration, there's a lot of room to innovate around software and great, great ideas. And we've just, you know, we've just touched the surface of that um, in terms of creativity. So I don't think it's predetermined one way or the other. Give me, give me a vision, not, not just four years out or eight years out, but let's, let's, go, let's go to, I don't know, 2040. Where is Intel going to be that far in the future? What's, what's your vision of the company's uh, 2040? State. Yeah, 2040, uh, uh, you know, a little, little ways away. But I think I'd like to see us back to where we were, which was, the, you know, the drivers of Moore's Law and, you know, the company that, you know, does things with physics and chemistry and metallurgy that nobody else on the planet can do, that continually, you know, upgrades the capability of what semiconductors can do today so that, you know, what was once impossible is now possible. Um, yeah, we, I was thinking earlier about some of your earlier comments about where is AI, where is AI superficial and where is AI meaningful. What's going to happen in this business is the EDA tool vendors that we work with closely, the synopsis of the world, the cadence of the world, they're embedding AI into their design systems right. so that the things that took, you know, a big team of designers multiple months to do can now take one designer one week. So imagine the creativity that we're unlocking through embedding AI into tools that are creating more powerful AI chips. So in some ways you have this virtual circle of AI helping to create the tools that help create more sophisticated AI. Now, I don't believe this runs into a, a Terminator kind of, you know, <laughs> Well, does it get GTA, GTA, GI, but it, I think? It, I mean, it, 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 it sounds yeah, plausible. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean Sam, Sam Altman absolutely believes that, you know, we will see AGI, you know, he says, you know, five, 10 years, if you can get enough CPUs all ganged together. If you can have 10 million CPUs figuring out a model, it could come out with something that's AGI. You know, I don't know enough about that to say whether or not that's true. I, what I do see is this idea that smarter systems will build smarter systems, right. that it'll be easier for people to create businesses and ideas, even in silicon in 2040, where people who have these great ideas have the tool set that takes out all the complexity of a concept all the way down to putting transistors on a piece of silicon. And who knows what that'll unleash? I, I find myself reading more and more science fiction to try to kind of offset my historical reading because mm -hmm. only through reading science fiction can you really envision where these technological leaps can mm -hmm. take us. Are you a science fiction reader? I am. I have been for, a, you know, since I was, a, I, that's what got me into the, got me into Intel was all that. So. I, I, I'm currently reading uh, some Neil Stevenson because I think Neil Stevenson had He's an almost virtual prophetic light. Yeah. insight. He was, he is one of the most prescient writers yeah. today. So I came across a passage uh, uh, in one of his 1990s uh, books, The Diamond Age, yeah. and you may remember this, in which one of the characters in an offhand way refers to PI. And first you think, what's PI? And, uh, and then he says, 
pseudo intelligence you know yeah. what we used to call artificial Something intelligence else, in yeah. the old days and it's a it's a brilliantly realized uh, vision of a world in which nanotechnology has yeah. just forged ahead to to a point that uh, is is mind-blowing and you kind of read it and you think well this is the world of fantasy and then you reflect on Snow Crash in which Great. he envisioned the internet he envisioned virtual reality yeah. he envisioned a lots of a lot right. of things that are real today who else do, should I be reading if I want to get a sense of where we'll be in 2040 I certainly read Stevenson I find when I read Isaac Asimov I'm, I'm somehow less mm. persuaded well he, he doesn't he doesn't go at computers the same way um, See, Stevenson was, was usually my go-to guy. There's a guy uh, who wrote Hyperion. You know, oh, uh, the, the Hyperion series mm -hmm. was... Uh, I mean, they're, a bit, they're a bit dystopian kind right. of things, I mean, but they're fascinating. The best science they, fiction's a bit dystopian. dystopian. It keeps you, us humble. So you, yeah, you can't get humble, but I think he's probably, he's probably the best prophet. Uh, and unfortunately, I've been... With, with coming back to Intel, I haven't had a chance to read much science fiction with Pat because we're, we're creating our own reality right yeah. now. Yeah, you're actually uh, making the, we, the science and, fiction fact. But I think if you look at what we, you know, Pat is fond of saying, you know, Moore's Law will continue until the periodic table is exhausted. And, you know, there's a lot of elements. To, I, you know, my counterpoint to that is there's also an economic law. So right. at some point we have to be able to afford all this stuff. I think the thing that hit me when I started looking at the history of, of computation is that Moore's Law actually predates Moore and it's going to outlive him. And it, it feels yeah. like even if we think there's some frontier in physics, history suggests we'll, we'll find a new way to keep that law yeah. applying. And that's, yeah. that's part of what's exciting about being right at the frontier. You're at the frontier of science itself. Yeah, so there's maybe one thought that, that we can close on. Uh, and this, this came up uh, at our Founder Day with Art Deguse, who's the uh, chairman of Synopsis. And Art talks about the law of the exponential. And that, you know, Moore's law, you know, was an exponential kind of law. It was doubling every, you know, every two years. But when you start adding packaging, you start mixing that. So, you know, if you think about chips, you know, they're basically 2D structures. What happens when you start putting chips on top of chips and vertically stacking them and integrating them? Now you innovate, as Pat's fond to say, you innovate X, Y, and now Z, which is a height dimension. We barely touch the surface of being able to innovate at an exponential level with packaging. So it'll be what he calls more than more. Right? And it really is more than more. So if you think the last 30, 40 years, more Gordon came out with this in 1965 is when he published the original paper. And he actually predicted in that paper this idea of advanced packaging. Right. And but we've just now started. And we're just now starting with the CAD tools and the simulation capability to be able to build these multiple stack devices. I think you really, we ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Well, that's perhaps the right note on which we conclude our, our conversation. The historian is always a little awestruck uh, <laughs> in a place like this. But the good news, is I think history is kind of on your side. I mean, this, this is, this is so. a, a plausible future. It's not science fiction. It's, uh, it's rapidly becoming science fact. And we can only hope, well, that politics doesn't get in the way, that geopolitics doesn't get in the way, and that the science and technology is able to play itself out to the optimal extent. Yeah. Well, we'll certainly do our part in doing that. Well, thank you for coming by and having this conversation. Thank you to the in, in Intel Alumni Network for joining us today. What a fascinating and insightful discussion we had this evening. Many thanks to Neil and Stu. For those interested in learning more about Neil Ferguson, please go to neilferguson.com to check out one of his numerous books. I personally recommend Civilization, The Square and the Tower, and Doom, but there are also many others. His efforts also at the University of Austin, Texas, and his consultancy, Green Mantle, are also definitely worth a look. I want to give a special shout out to three amazing Intel employees, Max Torres, Kimberly Smeja, and Michael Zuthan, who without their support for this event, it would not have happened. Many thanks also to the entire Intel Studios crew, led by Amber Jackson, this evening. Thanks also to the Intel Alumni Network board members, Dan Cohen, Mike Tr Trainer, Dan Feinberg, and Howard Jacob for their support as well. Our next big event is the always popular and annual Bum for Alums, hosted by longtime friend of the Intel Alumni Network, Jerry Batista, Vice President and General Manager of Intel's Roadmap Operations and Communications. So mark your calendars for the, uh, for the evening of May 16th. 
for our very first post-COVID hybrid event with in-person and online options being made available. More details will be coming soon and you will definitely want to hold this date. There's gonna be some exciting announcements. So once again, my deepest appreciation to our panelists, attendees, and the entire Intel family for your amazing support. And as always, your thoughts, musings, and feedback are always welcome. Thank you all, and have a wonderful evening.